Hello and welcome to Chanakya. Our guest today is a very uh, interesting and eminent personality, uh, Dr. Dalbi Ralawat, working in Sydney, a senior professor on international security in the Sydney University. Welcome, Dr. Dalbi Ralawat. Thank you so much for taking time and talking to Chanakya. How are you doing today? Thank you, Dr. Mala Subarnam. It's a great pleasure to be with you, and it it will be great to share my opinions or with you. Thank you, sir. So our, our focus today is going to be more on uh, what is the uh, state of Indo-Pacific uh, Indo politics that's happening, the, the geopolitics situation that is uh, surrounding the Indo-Pacific region, uh, especially with Australia and India being uh, strategic partners in Quad. And uh, we've also entered into bilateral, uh, a lot of bilateral treaties and other things. So what is your opinion on the current day Indo-Pacific uh, region politics? See, the Indo-Pacific region is passing through a big transformation because previously after the Second World War, the United States beca became a guarantor of peace in the, in the Asia-Pacific region. However, that continued and the other countries were, were focused on their economic development because their security was not an issue. They did not need not to spend heavy, invest, have heavy investments in the secu security sector. But the 9-11 in United States proved a benchmark when the United States focused its energy in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that created a power vacuum in the Asia Pacific region. And in the field of power, these vacuums are, are, not, are not there for long. So China that had the double digit growth over the decades and also had developed its military power filled that gap. And as the United States was busy in fighting wars against international terrorism, China started its sphere of influence in the Asia Pacific region, mainly the South China Sea. And with that rising power, that created a sort of curiosity or sort of concern in the, in the neighboring countries. What are China's intentions? Because China started claiming the territories, the disputed territories. As a result, there were, there were different inhibitions about rising China. What's going to do, going to happen? That way, by 2011, the United States felt the challenge from a rising China. And initially, China in the United States declared a pivot in Asia, and that was further led to the, the forming of the Indo-Pacific geostrategic construct. In this geostrategic, Indo-Pacific geostrategic construct, there are now different powers. Among them, the major power is the United States, then China, Russia, India, Australia and Japan. So these powers are looking at the better ways so that there is a rules-based order. And in that one, add, add the added dynamics to the security and strategic affairs are the trade relations. So each country is trying to reshuffle or counterbalance its strategies. And there we are where are today the Indo-Pacific region is in a flux. Yeah. Who, whom do you think is the greatest threat uh, in the Indo-Pacific region for Australia? See, threat is a very value-loaded term. Let's not say the threat, let's say the challenge. Probably. Yes, the challenge comes from China. Because Australia has been an alliance partner of the United States. And with the rise of China and its initiation of the Belt and Road Initiative, a global project in two, started in 2013. As a result, China is expanding in the Pacific, Island, Pacific Islands. And these Pacific Islands are generally considered as Australia's backyard. If the China comes with the military, military, military component there, that can be a threat for Australia. 
if it comes with only the trade relations, that can be a challenge. So we are somewhere at, as of now, between a threat and challenge. And this is being felt by, felt in the, I mean, in the Indian Ocean also, where the countries in the vicinity of India are also engaging China, the small island countries, mainly the, the case study. Sri Lanka. Country, Sri Lanka, yeah. where the Heaven Tota port is being handed over to China for 99 years. Yeah, so I have so, a question for you, Professor. Like in your article, I was reading that, you know, you, you typically explained it. So similar to how Solomon Islands, China is trying to get, uh, you know, have its uh, wings spread over Solomon Islands, which is strategically closer to Australia. You know, it's also trying to, uh, it's engulfed uh, Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka is dead driven con currently. So all these small, small strategic locations, island nations, which are rather strategic locations for businesses. Right. So all these things are getting falling into uh, China's, uh, uh, you know, China's uh, what should I call trap would be a very crude word, but China's interest, I should say. So probably what is the proactive measure that, you know, countries like India and Australia can do against this in, in your opinion? Like, you know, it's it's a, it's not more of a uh, I don't want to get into the external affairs thing or anything, but from from uh, uh, you, you have mentioned that you know we we are uh, we are we are the key drivers. We should we should uh, start being as key drivers in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, trying to are you what is what are your suggestions that you know countries like India and Australia should do in this? Yeah, that's a very vital question, and that the is the basically the focus of uh, focus for the scientists to look at it. How the geostrategic dynamics is taking place. Yeah, you are absolutely right that the Pacific Islands and the island were in the sphere of influence of Australia because these are aid dependent countries. They cannot survive on their own. So they depend upon the external aid. And Australia has been a major aid provider. In addition to that, Australia supports democracy, rule of law, freedom of press, gender equality, so these are the liberal value system that Australia champions in these island countries. There, there is a parallel there in the Indian Ocean, where India has also the island, island states in its vicinity, such as Maldives or Sri Lanka. There also the India has the cultural, historical, and religious, religious affiliations with these island countries for centuries. But of late, when China started the best Belt and Road Initiative, we call it BRI, yeah. then these countries were started attracting towards China because they wanted investment in their countries. So, so far as investment is there coming from China for any other country, that's there. But these countries were in the sphere of influence of India and Australia. And now there is a security component added to this. Because specifically on 15th August, India celebrates its Independence Day. And on that day, the uh, one of the China's China's ship was on the on the Heaven to Tap in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And that India, that for that makes India vulnerable that that can spy over Indian installations, mainly in the southern part of the country. Similarly, the, the, the island states in the vicinity of Australia have off and on being accused of signing some security related agreements. So there comes that both Australia and India face challenges in their vicinity in the small island states that are vulnerable. So for that, there is a there the one part is there that is China, and then who are the aggrieved? Australia and India. So there comes the component of some sort of convergence of interest between Australia and India. And it is quite pertinent that that previously during the Cold War, Australia and India were in totally different spheres of influence. Australia was the United States alliance partner whereas India maintained a non-alignment policy. But now both are trying to, trying to move closer because of their specific geostrategic interests. So the two countries have signed the Comprehensive Security Partnership, 
that is a big thing where the each other ships can visit the other country and also they have signed the logistics agreement where the indian ships can and come to a, come to the australian harbors and australians can visit the indians in addition both the countries are doing the bilateral naval exercises they are doing the trilateral naval exercises with australia japan india australia india united states and also they do the quadrilateral naval exercises like malabar so in a sense the two countries coming from the different backgrounds are toward the convergence trajectory and they are in the process of confidence building and in that confidence building takes time because both have the different weapon system australia gets from from united states india gets from russia previously soviet union then there are concerns about each others then the logistical issues so the the two countries are mapping each others capabilities each others each others capacity and but certainly they appear to be on a convergence trajectory because of the similar challenges faced by the two countries mm -hmm. nice and um, coming back to the uh, security uh, issues any any uh, hint or you know any details to us about what is happening in china so we are hearing a lot of rumors on social media platform which is still now unconfirmed from the you know uh, people's republic of china uh, that you know the president xi jinping is being kept under house arrest so uh, how much can you tell us on that any about that there is no no credible information mm -hmm. no doubt president xi jinping after a, after two years went outside the country and attended the shanghai cooperation organization meeting after that he returned and in return it appears that he has not uh, has a public appearance and that is being the, that is being, being causing that where the president of the country is so there are rumors that there are he is under house arrest there is the rumors that the military may not want him to be to be coming in the public but the issue is that i think that if he went overseas maybe some covid issues or some health issues but what is going to happen is that in october there will be the next congress of the communist party taking place and in that congress the president wants to be go for the third term as another 5 years mm -hmm. so the context is that whether the whether the party wants president xi jinping for the third term for next for third term or there are some divisions within the within the communist party because in china china has no military the military belongs to the communist party and it acts as as per that so as per there is no confirmed information that there is some sort of split or president is under house arrest but it appears that there may be some issues there may be contestants that who wants to be for the position of the president and still there is no no clear picture to to us yeah the the question of him coming out after 2 years that that itself has raised a lot of concerns or that has uh, been subjected to a lot of criticism uh, it has been uh, i'm sure it's all uh, you know unconfirmed sources but still it's it's been told uh, that his uh, main key agenda for coming out would be of you know for signing some um, getting into alignment with russia his meeting with uh, president uh, putin has been the key uh, focus for him coming into seo because he did not confirm his plan until two days of his visit mm -hmm. to uzbekistan right it, it was it was not a well planned um, uh, trip right he he i i happen to know that he confirmed his trip just two days before uh, flying there yeah in that context we can uh, say that the shanghai cooperation organization was initiated by china yes so china's president is expected there and then so same as, as about the russian president putin and russia and china are at, at the moment are have their relationship at the highest point 
though china has not supported you russian aggression in ukraine but china has not criticized either and their trade relationship has been there and two two leaders are in touch with each other so the chinese president going out to attend the shanghai cooperation organization perhaps that was required of the head of the state and he went there visited there i mean it was stated about in the indian prime minister he had his birthday on that day but he went there but there were some though this is a close knit organization but we saw some differences when indian prime minister did not shake hand with with or go close to the show the show the warmth toward the chinese president as he used to do in the past so there were some differences but these were in the shanghai cooperation organization not related to the internal matters of china mm -hmm. i was just concerned why would a person who's hosting would only announce it two days prior to his visit probably uh, uh, president uh, uh, you know zing uh, was uh, anticipating a coup or probably you don't know you never know you're right It's all speculation. Yeah, those are the internal matters. <laughs> in democracy, we come to know out through the media and other sources. Yeah. But in a communist communist con environment, it is difficult to come out the internal stories. And yes. still, we are not sure. But certainly, he is going for the going to contest for the third term. And there are certain factions that they want to avail the opportunity. Considering so the, the communist closeness. party, there may be some factions they want to. counterbalance one against the other and there comes the military component because the military is controlled by the communist party of china mm -hmm. so some journals may not be happy or there may be some different variations or opinions about maybe it. internally you never know as you right yeah, yeah we we can't come your government can't <laughs> right. yeah no yeah that's mm -hmm. correct so considering the uh, closeness between russia and china how far mm -hmm. russia is going to be a uh, impacting factor in this uh, geopolitical uh, arena when it comes to the indo pacific uh, region yeah what would china, be russia's impact yeah that way russia has be russia is a major factor in the indo pacific region mm -hmm. mainly the central asian countries still they are uh, they were part of soviet union but now the soviet union imploded it so they retain strong ties with russia then comes the russian weapon system during the cold war soviet union used to supply the weapons to india to vietnam and other countries so the, those those weapon system that supply that used to come you cannot cut off all of a sudden because you need to have relationship for spare parts such as india india has been trying to diversify its its arms trade in arms imports but still 60% of its trade is with russia same is with russia russia's 25% arms trade is with india so they both that is a complement and supplementary for the two countries comes the point of the ukraine russia uh, war in that case many countries in the asia pacific region have not criticized russia because of their ongoing relate even india china vietnam and other countries have not criticized so that way comes the a, a major role for russia but certainly russia and china have a major relationship that is developing from the trade to the to the geopolitical perspectives so russia is a factor there many countries have not criticized Russia so far. So, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific region, do you think uh, Russia's uh, support would be leaning towards China more? Probably is high in that. Yeah, in that case, we can draw the two parallels, mm -hmm. such as Russia has waged a war against Ukraine. Similar parallels are being drawn that China will be stepping up its pressure on Taiwan. Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. it has conducted a naval exercises all around the island island state and this has been giving signals passing through the air space and others so that has it has expected that if russia is successful in ukraine 
then who can stop China from taking taking Taiwan? America. So those are the parallels being drawn because the U US, US US can stop them. President Biden recently announced that it would uh, the United States will come and support if some, uh, China is trying to take over Taiwan. Couple of yes, yeah, there are signals from signals from United States. Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, visited, and yeah. some other senators visited there. But the issue is that the the passing a statement is one aspect. Other aspect is why not stop the war in Ukraine? If you draw the parallels, and there have been other previous incidents where the United States provided support but did not came with the, its military, its military, ac active military on the in defense of any country. There are so there is still still the, that opinion is there. But other opinion is that the United States withdrew last year from Afghanistan after 20 years. So there's a war fatigue in United States. And then financially also there are some issues in United States. So the question arises, the strategists are considering, how do United States again like to fight a war? Military fatigue is there that has economic repercussions. And if United States jumps, what will be the outcome? Because, because that will be putting China and China and Russia further closure. Both are authoritarian governments, two, two, two leaders, they, they can come further. And in a sense, the other countries, how the ASEAN will be responding to that. Because Russia will, so United States will jump into militarily looking at the, at the, the regional dynamics. For regional dy dynamics, the major organization is ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Mm -hmm. That will perhaps not support a war that would like to go through dialogue and diplomacy. Then comes Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and Australia whether they would like to support and provide logistical sports to the to United States, though they are alliance partners, but that they have to consider their own circumstances. Then comes a major country like India. In, would India like to, to be part of the war against China? Perhaps India may not go to that to that level. It may criticize. It may I don't criticize. think India would. Yeah, it may enhance relations with Taiwan. But supporting a war, that may be, there will be some reservations in India. So it appears that there are, one, China will be very, very careful because China is rising and it may not go for a war. China has never fought a war where the logistics are required, the air power and the space and the, the naval power and the armed forces, that coordination they have never done. Whereas the United States is a, experienced player. It has fought in different battlefields. But the issue is that if it con further conflagrates, as Russia is threatening that it can use the nuclear nuclear weapons, perhaps if China also comes with that one. So war is a different far away war cry, war cry is there. But I don't think that there can be a war in current circumstances, mainly in the Indo-Pacific region. Very nice. Thank you so much, Professor. Thanks for spending your valuable time with us and talking to us. Uh, best wishes. Oh, and that's a great it. opportunity. And thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Yes.